Edo government set for showdown with promoters of planned sultanate in the state. We'll be finding out why the government considers it a direct assault on the traditions of Edo people. The Police Service Commission sets up a new panel to investigate the FBI's report on policeman Abba Kiari. And the Taliban reportedly goes after persons who helped the United States in Afghanistan. And welcome to The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. It's a very upbeat Friday today. Good morning. Absolutely. And I am Annetta Felix. And I am Osaogi Ogbon. And thanks for joining us on a Friday. Um, of course, thanks for staying with us all through the week. We hope it's going to be a very interesting two hours mm. uh, for you. So our top trending story is really going straight to the point for the first one. We know that it's been a long-running investigation um, by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI in the United States, into alleged money laundering by Nigerian um, self-confessed internet fraud star Hush Poppy. Um, we found U.S. documents, over 90 pages, detailing the involvement of Abba Kiari, you know, a, a police boss. And uh, it, it's... it's the whole con um, con com conversation regarding his indictment really has set the Nigerian police force, you know, into an investigative series to determine Abiyakari's role in this. So they went on um, to set up an investigative panel. That panel has been on for a while. And the news we're hearing now is that the Nigerian Police Service Commission has set up another in-house panel. Um, they said this was constituted to study the documented evidence pre presented by the U.S. Um, FBI um, against the suspended Deputy Commissioner of Police, Abakari. Now, this new panel will be headed by the Director, Department of Public of Police Discipline in the Commission, um, Barry Stati, Jani Mohammed. And um, this was inaugurated on Thursday, you know, by Secretary to the Police Service Commission. So we really have questions to ask about this. Um, the first panel was set up. We have evidence from the FBI. Um, we've seen evidence as well from um, uh, Hush Puppies transactions. We've seen evidence from Hush Puppies um, text messages, communication with Abe Kari. And this is now a second investigative panel. Um, first of all, it reminds me of the Nigerian situation and how we seem to have think that committees is the solution for this. There could be an issue and then you'd find um, government authorities setting up committees upon committees upon committees to look into one particular matter. And you look back years later to audit that situation and you really can't find what really was the result. The most we see is that that committee now presents a report and you see making headlines, committee presents reports on that. Then the issue about implementation of those resolutions is where we seem to be hanging? Um, well, um, I'll start by saying, um, you know, I think you're on point when you called it an investigative series, you know, because, you know, it feels like we're in episode one uh, <laughs> or season one, episode three, you know, and then we're going to go on to next seasons um, um, of uh, Abakari. Um, this should be shown on Netflix, I guess, uh, because how many, how many panels do you need to investigate evidence that is right in front of you? You know, is the Nigerian Police uh, Service Commission then saying that they don't trust the FBI or that they might know more than the FBI or the FBI may, you know, not have done a, a thorough job? You know, I'm not sure, you know, what exactly needs to be investigated. It's really, you know, there's, there's not so much English that needs to be, um, you know, spoken here. Um, I've also seen a lot of people react to this and, you know, describe this as, um, you know, delay tactics, basically, you know, and they're trying to delay as much as possible instead of doing what is entirely right. And what is right mostly because of the, you know, to save the face of the current administration, which, um, you know, had come into power, you know, stating that they were going to be uh, fighting corruption. It was one of the core things that they stated when um, contesting for the election um, a couple of years ago. And so we've had multiple opportunities for the current administration to actually fight corruption. And that includes um, different cases that we've seen here and there, people who have been charged. But, you know, we still haven't seen any, any um, um, answers. The former SGF to the president, I um, don't remember his name now, you know, who was also accused of uh, grass cutting scandal, you know, is still you know, has not, you know, had, had uh, any case against him. There was an investigative report that was sent to the president years ago till today, till tomorrow morning, till next week, till very likely 2022. I'm very sure that nothing will happen to that report. And so I'm not sure what, you know, what's the use of these series of investigations that uh, they, they keep setting up, you know. And of course, 
you know, a lot of people who have shared those views, you know, seem to be right. I don't think I've seen anyone who says, oh, this is the right thing to do. Let them investigate. Maybe the FBI, FBI was wrong. Maybe it wasn't really Abakiari. Okay. Um, it is, you know, just your know, delay tactics. And that's, that's really what it is. Nothing more than that. And people have also referred to other administrations and mostly the Obasanjo administration and how he... In his time, yes, there was also um, accusations of corruption in his government, but um, there were times when he needed to, you know, show working, uh, you know, as in, in um, Nigerian, Nigerian parlance. parlance. Um, and he did. And if you remember Tafa Balugu, who was the IG of police, who was accused of corruption, there was no, you know, investigative panel left and right, you know, with regards to Tafa Balugu. He was hounded like a corrupt, you know, police officer. And there was so much drama at that time. Um, there's also, of course, the uh, Alamasiega's Alama uh, case. There's also Charles Taylor, the uh, Liberian president at that time, who mm -hmm. was in Nigeria. There's um, also uh, James Ibori. There's so many, many, many examples of times when Obasanjo at that time had to, once again, in Nigerian Parliament, show working. And he did. So the current administration and President Muhammadu Buhari continues to let all these, you know, characters and these uh, incidents happen. It really just, you know, says a lot about what the current administration really stands for and you know if they will you know take action when there is a need to take action and it's it's embarrassing now talking about the setting up of committees we know that the the president um, commissioned a committee to go ahead to let me read exactly how they said it they said this committee was set up to determine the levels of encroachment and carry out its assignments with dispatch and what this is talking about is that there was a committee that was set up you know, to look into grazing reserves in Nigeria and for the possible revitalization of about 368 grazing reserves across 25 states in Nigeria. Um, this issue, really, so many sides to it because, first of all, we know that um, during a popular interview the president granted a sister station, um, he had mentioned that one of his own ways that he would use to handle this um, farmer's headers clashes is that he was going to, uh, he had actually ordered the AGF to look into grazing reserves of the 90s and see how that can be revived. That really generated a stare and people said, first of all, the grazing reserves was, was not a law. So it's not, it's not even a law right now. It's not something you can just enforce in state. Second of all, we know the position of Southern governors on grazing reserves. They had all come together to speak in one voice to condemn open grazing and said that from September the 1st, which is in a few weeks' time, that they were going to openly ban that grazing, you know, and saying kids can also not be involved in that, or you had to get some sort of license or permit from the state. But now that this committee has gone ahead to submit its report and the president has approved the recommendation of these grazing reserves, now the issue is, what really would be the stance of, you know, these southern governors? Would they shift ground or would the federal government hold sway? Um, see some of the recommendations that this committee made. They said that um, they had recommended the collection of field data um, across the 368 grazing reserves across 25 states. And that's to assess encroachment, encroachers, stakeholders' engagement and sensitization. So let's, let's break down the big grammar. The committee also said that they were going to begin to map out this 25 state. They were going to um, start geomapping. They were going to um, give out an analysis of their findings. They were also going to design communications regarding grazing reserves. So it's a lot that it has to do. But still the question is, is it going to be now the federal government versus the state government? Are these 25 states inclusive of the states in, you know, this, this southern region that have banned or, you know, declared open grazing to be illegal in their states? Um, still lots of information that we need to know. And um, can't wait to see the response of the southern governors um, about this. Um, yeah, so I, I, you know, this really, you know, brings back, um, you know, the thoughts uh, that, you know, a lot of people have shared, you know, with regards why um, the government is taking, you know, um, headers so seriously and why we've not been able to do what is necessary. Um, the, the, the action of the Nigerian government with regards, you know, headers alone, you know, has been, you know, from, from a lot of people's views has been a little, you know, questionable. Um, state governors have, you know, made their, you know, their stance open. You know, they said that from the 1st of September, you know, it's going to be completely banned, um, which, of course, that they have a, a right to. Uh, there was also some controversy with uh, the, um, um, with Abu Bakr Malami and uh, the Nigerian government a couple of weeks ago with regards to their own stance on, on open grazing also. Um, you know, most of the questions that, you know, would also come up for this is, you know, why aren't 
or why isn't the Nigerian government putting the same energy or the same interest into other uh, businesses across Nigeria? Why aren't they looking for land or searching for grazing reserves or searching for um, you know places where other people can also do business? You know, every other person who wants to do business and cattle rearing is a business. It might be something that is cultural for a particular part of the country, but it still is a business. Every other person who's doing business in Nigeria has to find a place, you know, pay for land, pay a rent a shop, and do their business, and of course pay their taxes. And so that's what has always been. Why exactly is um, uh, grazing entirely different, or why is the government taking it, you know, seriously? I've spoken, you know, a lot about the body language of the of the of uh, the government. A lot of times, um, people get feedback not from the things that you say, uh, not from necessarily the laws that you put into play, but, but you know, the way that you react to certain things as a government. And, you know, the way that the Nigerian government has continued, and that includes its silence, uh, sometimes when lives are even lost, when there's killings in villages and communities in certain parts of the country, um, you get to see, and, and it's just a great example is um, a time when, um, not long ago, there's a particular sheikh who had threatened, the, uh, you know, that there was going to be retaliation in uh, Plateau State, you know, for the lives that were lost. Um, he said that old Fulanis don't forgive. Like, that's according to what the news, uh, you know, carried. Um, and then a couple of days later, he's seen in, you know, Asso Rock meeting with President Mahmoud Bari along with the uh, Minister of Communication and Digital Economy, uh, Issa Pantami. And so those things, you know, you might say, oh, the president maybe, you know, wants to have a word with the with the sheikh, um, you know, wants to, you know, uh, you know, bring peace and some of all of that. But those actions, you know, really just tells a totally different story. Or, or it's, it's, it's read, you know, in a, diff in a way for the Nigerian people. And it's pretty much the same thing with these grazing reserves. Um, if the governors have said that they do not want people grazing on their land, and if you want to, you know, a rare cattle, you buy land, you, you know, apply for it, you get land and then you can rear your cattle. Um, that's really not so difficult to understand or not so difficult to, to, um, to, um, to deal with. Um, but the Nigerian government continues to push for grazing reserves and continues to, you know, put this foot forward, which really a lot of times doesn't sit well with uh, the Nigerian people. And it also looks very much like it's still not a government that is listening to what the people are saying. Because if the people, you know, if generally a lot of people have said that this is not what we want, um, you look at, you know, weigh the consensus and then you say, okay, well, you know, there's more people who do not want this to continue. There's more people who have seen that this has caused loss of lives and loss of property and families have been wiped out and some of all of that. And so I would, you know, be very, very careful with the stance that I take. But when you instead you know, take actions that don't seem to be, you know, actions that are coming from uh, listening to the people. It's, 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 um, it just doesn't look good in any way. Whew. The next stop trending doesn't look good. And um, it, it is with a heavy heart that I say this, that, okay, first of all, we all know that the first son of the late revolutionary chief, um, human rights lawyer, Chief Kanifami, passed on on August 11th, earlier this year. And, um, he was age 52 and the family, you know, didn't say much during that time because they said that um, they wanted to first of all get all the facts, all the medical facts regarding the cause of his death. That's even why they delayed his burial and, has, and have fixed it for August the 27th um, to hold both in, um, the ceremony to hold both in Lagos and Undo State. So at a press briefing um, yesterday, Thursday, Saheed Farami, the second son of um, late Chief Ghani Farami, spoke on behalf of the family, uh, revealing the cause of Muhammad's death. And he said that, um, let, let, let me quote him verbatim, he said that the family could not immediately comment on the cause of their brother's death because they wanted the information to be based on factual medical details, especially as may be contained in the death certificate. He went in to say today, however, we are in a position to inform you that our dear brother died from COVID-19 related complications. And arising from this, we want to urge all Nigerians to take necessary precautions to avoid being infected by the deadly disease. And he went on to encourage us to um, continue to wear a face mask and you know, adhere to social distancing and all of that. So this really is just a reminder of the fact that we're still very much in a, in a pandemic. You know, um, and that we should take this as seriously as, you know, we did when we heard of our index case on February 24th, 2020. COVID-19 is still very much raging and ravaging the world. People are still getting infected. People are still dying from the disease and that it's up to us really to stay protected.
Yeah, absolutely. And Saad, uh, I met uh, Mohammed a few weeks ago. Um, you know, there's a particular interview that I had to be at their residence, uh, you know, and I interviewed him. Very, very interesting personality. Um, and it's also, it, so, it, so that hurts me on a, you know, totally different level. Um, you know, and also it, it feels like the Fawami family would be mourning, you know, first of all, of course, losing Ghani, who was one of the loudest voices um, in uh, Nigeria. Um, um, and um, he, activist, you know, lawyer, you know, senior advocate of Nigeria and all of that. Um, and then his son, you know, who also tried to walk in his footsteps, you know, but, you know, the, so um, it's a sad thing to, you know, the family. Um, but once again, I, I, but I like, you know, the fact that they've used this opportunity to also remind people of the uh, risk that we still are facing with regards COVID-19, you know, and, and it's going to be really, really, um, I don't think there's anybody, I'm, well, funny enough, I think there's still people who believe that it's fake or it doesn't exist. Um, so these are, you know, just great opportunities, sadly, of course, with the loss of life. But these are, you know, incidents that people need to look at to remind themselves of how deadly uh, COVID-19 is. Um, and if you have gotten vaccinated, um, it doesn't mean that you, you know, should continue to live recklessly. Um, if you have not gotten vaccinated, it's, it's a reminder that you should try to get vaccinated um, as quickly as possible. Uh, the government is still sourcing as much as it can, um, uh, more vaccines. vaccines. You know, I remember more than I think uh, arrived. Uh, we're still, of course, uh, meant to uh, continue with the second uh, yeah. vaccination, yeah. second doses for AstraZeneca. Um, um, and so um, it's important that everyone, everybody does get vaccinated or at least have a fighting chance against COVID-19. Um, the the uh, Delta variant, and I was speaking to someone yesterday trying to you know understand at best you know, how it is more transmissible, you know, is it now airborne? Is it, you know, suddenly, you know, no, does the Delta variant not, or uh, the um, vaccination not, you know, help with Delta variant? Just many, many questions that need to be answered that I hope that we will be able to answer on this uh, um, platform, hopefully sometime next week, um, just to get more clarity on the Delta variant. But um, it's a reminder uh, to wear your face mask, to wash your hands, to stay at home if possible, if you don't have any business. Uh, Lagos nightclubs are still filled up every weekend. Uh, people are still, of course, passing the, you know, the, you know, the virus from one to another. If you look at the figures yesterday, I was shocked. You know, more than a thousand uh, positive cases across the country. Lagos is still having staggering figures, and so these are things that everybody needs to be reminded of to ensure that they stay safe and we're able to win uh, this fight. Indeed, yes, um, that's it on top trending today. We'll take a break here and return with off the press. <laughs>